Hello and welcome back everybody to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John and welcome to episode 183. Uh, it's really a uh, ramble along. We keep getting good questions. Reminder, if you have questions, send them to me at podcast at DanJohnUniversity.com. We'll do our best to answer each and every one. I really appreciate the, the quality of the questions that are coming in lately. Uh, Boy, I tell you, uh, one nice thing that's going on in my life right now, and it's the next group is opening up, but I have this thing called the the Inner Circle. And now if you want to be part of it, go to danjohninnercircle.com uh, to apply for the next group. Uh, we usually take about 10 to 15 people, and we go for a couple of months and we talk. My favorite thing is just the, well... In the last few weeks, we've been sharing our breakfasts, and everyone's trying to out uh, out colorful each other. You know, I tend to have a very colorful breakfast with the salmon, the the, the eggs, the kimchi, the the oranges, the uh, the different vegetables. I'll put on green salsa sometimes, and uh, I have I put uh, sushi ginger in my breakfast and sauerkraut that I make here at the house, and it's been fun. I, I like that kind of thing. Uh, also, too, sometimes when tragedies happen around the world, uh, what's nice about the inner circle is uh, I will be getting little uh, alerts from the various different ways we talk to each other and about I'm safe here and I'm safe there. And I, and I think that's just absolutely wonderful and, 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 and it's, it's a great thing to have. Um, the book is selling well. Remember, if you want a copy of the book, EasyStrengthOmnibook.com. Uh, I love it. I think it's a great book. Obviously, I wrote it. Uh, but I'm getting lots and lots of feedback from people about they finally understand the Easy Strength system, which is so simple, it you'll miss it. Uh, and, and it's true about so many things in life, folks. You know, sometimes the simplest things you can do. Just read an article <laughs> about the easiest way to detoxify your body. Drink more water and sleep better. And I'm like, well... Okay, what about, you know, drinking, is it apple cider vinegar with maple syrup with cayenne pepper or whatever the hell it is? Yeah, no, doesn't help you at all. It does make you f very unpopular for your few days. Uh, but uh, yeah, so everything very often comes down to, you know, the simple stuff that you already know, the stuff grandma told you, st stuff ma to told you, in my case anyway, my mom. So uh, let's get started with our questions. Uh, so two quick things. Um, if you want to be part of the inner circle, uh, danjohninnercircle.com to apply. And then, of course, uh, Dan John, uh, uh, pardon me, the easystrengthomnibook.com for the other one. Easystrengthomnibook.com. Well, um, let's get going. Uh, and if you guys, by the way, and if you have ever, you want to respond, the YouTube site is very good about uh, I guess it's very easy to log in and, and go ahead and ask questions all you want. Um, this is this is a tough question. It's from Kunal. And Kunal asked this. I am reaching out to check if you have a body weight version of the Easy Strength program. Well, one of the problems with body weight work, and, and it's it's not a problem. I mean... If you decided to get into gymnastics, especially as a male, uh, it is interesting because uh, when you go to the Olympics and look at uh, the sport of gymnastics, it does come right out of the military training. Uh, the pommel horse, of course, was to train yourself to be more effective on, a, on horseback, and everything else is basically escape and evasion stuff. Uh, so, but I mean, if you want a really great upper body uh, <laughs> joint, Join here, college gymnasts and gymnastics team, or what if I know it's a it's a sport that is very specialized and is getting harder and harder on the male side to find uh, uh, places to do it. Um, I mean, I mean, if you want to be dense, I mean, the parallel bars, the high bar, <laughs> that's gonna <laughs> the floor work. Your your upper body is gonna be racked and jacked. Uh, the downside always with body weight work is the lower body stuff. Now, if you were uh, to learn practice gymnastics every day and combine that with hill sprints, 
you probably would have everything pretty much done. But did you see what I had to do already as I had to throw the hill in there for some kind of load? Um, the, the, the physics of the hill provides the load in this case. Um, I, I like bodyweight work. Uh, that's, of course, where all of us started. Um, I don't have my copy of Arnold, The Educational Bodybuilder anymore. I bought it the day it came out, by the way. I went to the bookstore and, and I bought the book and I, I got a weird look from the lady like there was something wrong with me. Uh, they had one copy uh, back then. I think it was 1975 when it came out. I think and then Pumping Iron was a year or two later. Uh, back then, man, if you bought a bodybuilding book, you, people looked at you funny like there was something wrong with you. And there was. And there was something wrong with me. I, I lifted weights and I'm not ashamed to admit that out loud. Um, he has that whole course that you really should follow. He recommends six months of it before you ever touch a weight. And I actually agree. Um, I think if you do the pull-ups, the push-ups, the, 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 the dips between chairs and all that kind of thing, long-term, I think you'd be happy you did that. Uh, most people don't do that. Uh, in fact, most people who lift weights for two weeks are now, you know, absolutely you know, they know everything because they read a they read a <laughs> they read some idiotic thing online and now they have they're belong to a tribe of of idiots basically uh, <laughs> William Shakespeare a good friend of mine growing up uh, he said uh, you are the idol of idiot worshipers and I feel that way sometimes when you look at some of the craziness you see on the internet uh, can you do body weight only easy strength you sort of kind of do as you go through your normal development. Uh, if you're trying to up your number of push-ups you can do as a, as a teenager for the PE test, you'll probably follow the easy strength protocols. Uh, when I improved my pull-up for the pull-up test, we got tested on pull-ups constantly as a kid and I sucked at them. Um, but the way you improve your pull-ups is you, in my case anyway, uh, I don't remember the other boy's name, um, I want to say it was Andrew Chang, but I, I, I think my memory is is a little bit weak there. Andrew Chang, Steve Ludwig, and myself used to go up to the pull-up bars and just practice ideas, including hanging by your toes and all kinds of idiocy. But that's how I got my pull-up number, so I could max out that uh, those tests, those fitness tests they used to give us. So it does work. Frankly, though, uh, Kunal, I got to tell you, it. It works, body weight works, kind of, until it doesn't. Now, if you're gonna spend seven hours a day uh, training for the Olympics as a gymnast, it's gonna keep working for you for a long time. Um, but for us mere mortals, um, the dose probably isn't enough. Um, you do need to have some kind of progressive resistance exercise, exercise to make um, easy strength work. It's the question I get when people say, Dan, just give me a, kettlebell only program well if you're like me and i have i have uh, about 45 kettlebells in my home gym now you know i can get away with a lot in my home gym with kettlebells but i also have three olympic bars and i gotta tell you it's easier to use the olympic bars than the kettlebells for easy strength um and and if you, you follow some of my rules it's even easier uh that great lesson i was up at utah state and uh, i was telling uh, the people i was with about when i was there all we had was 45 pound plates and 25 pound plates. And for the track and field team, we didn't have any other plates. So I got to tell you, I think some of the roots of easy strength in my mind came from training in the Nelson Fieldhouse with just 45s and 25s and a, a one single barbell, a good York barbell. Uh, because if, if you're snatching 135, the next jump is 185. And that's, that's a pretty serious jump. Um, so it's just something, uh, I mean, I, I guess I could tell you that you can do an experiment with a easy strength body weight idea. If you just took some of the principles, you're probably already doing them. But if I were to tell you to tick, pick five body weight exercises and do them every day for 40 days, and you could do it either five days a week or just the straight 40, I think by the time you got to the end of the 40 days, you'd make very impressive progress. I mean, I think the ab wheel is body weight, uh, the pull-up is body weight, the dip is body weight, the pull-up chin-up. So ab wheel, pull-up chin-up, 
dip, you know, you'll really max out push-ups way too fast. And now we run into the problem is what's an appropriate hinge and what's an appropriate squat. Uh, obviously, you could do body weight squats. Someone's going to mention in the comments, Hindu squats, and I've never gotten any value out of them. But um, I would say those three upper body, the ab wheel, the pull, pull up, chin up, the dip, those are going to work uh, marvels. I guess if you throw in some hill sprints, that would be good, or stadium steps. And then another exercise, you know, you could do something as simple as those, you know, back extension supermans, we call them. That might be good, though. Again, there's no progressive resistance exercise. Hip thrust from the floor, I do those literally every day um, to, to get my body ready to do the Olympic lifts. But even then, you know, and I do a lot of reps in the hip thrust uh, to warm up. I mix them with clamshells, um, uh, and I use the Brett Contreras' glute loop. My favorite one is go 15 hip thrusts, 15 clamshells, then 14, 14, 13, 13, down to 1-1. One, one. And that's a lot of reps. Um, and it gets the job done for what I need, so it prepares me to Olympic lift and a front squat. But well, that's a tough one. Uh, so the answer is, there are things you can do, but you're going to run into a problem when you move into the squat, the hinge, uh, hands, you know, handstand walking, I guess, is loaded carries. But yeah, you're going to run into a problem with three of the five major movements. So I would say the answer is you can try it. But I think you're going to see a wall hit you pretty soon. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with the wall you hit when you only train body weight. <laughs> it's a good wall to hit. You know, if you get your chin up up to 35 reps and your dip up to 35 and you ab wheel 35 times and you, know, and you don't get any injuries from it, that's, a, that's pretty impressive. Um, it, and you probably look good and feel good. And if you can add in any kind of lower body work with it, it's going to be pretty good. You're not going to win Highland Games or the, the discus throw, and you're probably, you know, there is an example of one person making the NFL without lifting weights and doing lots of push-ups, sit-ups, and uh, uh, that kind of thing, and, and sprinting. But uh, unless your name's Herschel Walker, <laughs> uh, I don't know. So it's it it's a good idea. I like it. Uh, I can't put one together because I'm... I'm not going to do it. So if I don't do something, I, I usually don't. I always do a program before I recommend it, and I don't see myself doing that. So you're going to have to do this experiment on your own, which is great. All right? Thank you so much. It's a good question. I don't do a good job answering it. I realize that because it's just not something I, I'm going to spend a lot of time thinking about because, oh, and I got nothing against bodyweight training. That has to be made clear. But... I use kettlebells, uh, barbells, and other equipment to, to, for my personal needs. Uh, you know, if this was a question from 1971, 1972, when I was first starting up, uh, we would have probably trained together and had a lot of fun, but I've kind of progressed beyond that. Uh, and thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, Mike has a question. Um, had a question about training frequency. I am 52 years old, 5'8", 167, and I'm trying to build, maintain muscle and overall health and longevity. I am currently using the workout generator. Okay, for those who don't know, danjohn. Uh, pardon me, uh, danjohnuniversity.com. We have, uh, when you sign up, we have a thing called the workout generator. You put what equipment you have. You, you basically answer two, three questions about number of times a week and duration and intensity. And then this thing just spits out uh, really good programs, mixing uh, push-pull, hinge squat, loaded carry with original st strength movements and mobility movements. And you can you can raise and lower uh, the exercises anytime you want. Uh, I've when I did use it for a while, I found myself, uh, you know, there there'd be days like, don't you know who I am? I'm gonna front squat, and the next day come in and go. Don't you know who I am? I'm going to do a suspension trainer squat. So, and that's fine. You know, sometimes you're, you're doing three sets of 12 in a double kettlebell front squat. And some days you're doing three sets of 12 in the uh, suspension trainer squat. Okay. Um, and really enjoying lifting six days a week, Mike tells us. I know the importance of recovery and lately I've tried to space out the workouts, 
So there is a recovery day in between weight training workouts. But my problem is that I prefer that tight feeling that I get after I complete a weight training workout. So I always drift back to train with weights six days a week. At my age, am I just spinning my wheels? No. And preventing any gains in strength and muscular development by training so frequently. Would there be any value in utilizing some kettlebells during the training week to break things up? Or should I force myself to adhere to a day off between workouts? You know, okay, should you work out every day? Yes, yes, you should. <laughs> should, <laughs> should you go for the world record every day in training? No, probably not. A um, couple things, uh, and let me spitball a few ideas back to back to back for you. First off, I always liked something I learned from a, a Bulgarian coach when he corrected me and he said, no, no, we don't lift to our max, our lifetime max every day. We lift to our training max every day. And I thought, oh boy, did I misunderstand everything you guys have been talking about. And it really opened some doors for me. So Mike, if you're doing this, if three days a week you're doing um, front squats, or just since we were talking about, and the other three days a week you're doing the goblet squat, the suspension trainer squat, some other kind of variation, and, and even some of the lunge family there, um, what you, what you, I, I would use, if I were you, those three hard workouts. That's just the Monday, Wednesday, Friday workout. I would use those workouts to, that. those would be the ones I would actively try to, and to use your words, get your gains and strength and muscular development, train those three days. The other three days, I would go in and maybe even stick with the same rep and set screen, but just, you know, when you go on the workout generator, you can scroll down the exercises, scroll down each of those major exercises into something that will allow you to do it an enhanced recovery. Now, this is a concept, this is a concept everybody knows at some level, but I really did learn it from Dick Notmeyer the best. If you were sore from snatches and cleaning jerks on Monday, when you came in Tuesday to lift, we started with front squats, those first six, seven, eight sets, and we did a lot of sets, um, a lot of them would kind of undo the tightness, the soreness, that uh, that weird locked up feeling you get when you're sore from the Olympic lifts, oh, like the traps and the mid back and the, uh, the, it can't be the hamstrings, the glutes and whatever these muscles are, my God. Um, but after a couple sets of front squats, I had greased myself up. I had lubricated my joints. I felt good and I could press on. Of course, show up Wednesday, I'd be sore from Monday and Tuesday. And of course, we would repeat snatch and clean and jerk. We took Thursdays off and then Friday, snatch, clean and jerk and Saturday, uh, the, the front squats and the jerks. It was a great program. And so maybe I don't want you to go as heavy as I did when I was 17, 18, 19, because you could recover back then. But the idea of doing the movements, so three hard days a week with the workout generator, and then three days where you lighten up on the movements and get that feeling of just kind of feeling good, ties us right back to that body weight training question, because sometimes those movements are like almost just body weight training exercises. Should you weight lift every day? I, I think you can, and, I, and you don't even need to split it up. I think you can do whole body workouts every day, but you have to have the idea, um, very much like that Hungarian training programs from the late 60s and early 70s, where Olympic lifters would go, you know, heavy three days a week in the gym, and then the next day come back and repeat the same workouts with just 60% of the weight they did the day before. So you could practice your technique and the movements, and you're, you're trying to lay on you're trying to tell your nervous system, this is what I want, this is what I want, this is what I want. And you repeat those workouts to teach your body to make the lifts and, and, and move better. And move better and ideally, and with your case here, um, you know, look better and all the rest that goes along with that. Um, the movement, the, the movement of training every day, um, it, it does hit your recovery properties a lot. But the nice thing is, is that's what you're doing. And over time, your body seems to adapt. 
I'm guessing, Mike, that you and I might be the kind of people who can train six days a week. And this is something to think about because we do have some more gentle listeners who might not be able to train heavy six days a week. We might have some people who can only train heavy, heavy, who can't, um, who can train six days a week. We might have some people who can train really hard one day a week and have two check-in workouts, you know, three days a week. Um, the tradition in the weight room up until the mid sixties, 1960s, was you'd have a heavy day, a light day, a medium day, a heavy day, a light day, a medium day, training three days a week. Um, if you studied the the work of Jim Schmitz, the my co my coach when I was young and good looking, uh, he's the great Olympic lifting coach, Sports Palace, originally San Francisco, now in my hometown, South San Francisco. Um, his programs went heavy, light, heavy, light, heavy, light, um, and. What we're gonna do in the program you're doing is what I think you should do is heavy, light, heavy, light, heavy, light in a week and make your light workouts light and make your heavy workouts as heavy as you appropriately can and see if you can uh, have some success doing that. Uh, you, you mentioned adopting kettlebells and I would certainly, I mean, it uh, depends on what you wanna do with them. If you're just using kettlebells to do the traditional press and front squat and you just stay with the equipment you have. Now, if you wanna swing over into stuff like uh, the kettlebell snacks, the kettlebell swing and all that other, all the other movements of the kettlebell world, um, maybe do something along the line of six to 12 weeks of doing the concept we just outlined before. And then taking a taking some time anywhere for three to three to six weeks to explore the kettlebell movements, and then come back to what you're doing. I always think it's a good idea to finish a program, and then when you finish it, to go into something that's kind of refreshing uh, physically and mentally. Um, I'm, as I'm talking today, I'm, I'm starting up on I'm getting ready for an Olympic lifting meet. So after a couple of weeks. Yeah, almost almost two full months of basic bodybuilding. I'm back to Olympic lifting, and that really works well for me. And it's and it's repeatable, doable for me. It's reasonable, and uh, I, I get a lot of benefit out of it. After my meet, the following Monday, I'll go back to a basic bodybuilding program. Um, I think it does help to have that kind of variation over. Every six to 12 weeks, it could be longer for some people, could be shorter for others. Generally for me, eight to 12 weeks is about a long, it's about as long as I want to be on a particular program, you know, eight to 12. I like to get things about two full months. But Mike, this is a good question. It's a good question. And the answer is, uh, I would stick with what you're doing. Uh, I like the fact that a 52 year old man is training six days a week. Just remember, if you're gonna have three workouts where you kind of go after it with a traditional lift, have those other three workouts be kind of tonic. I like the idea of doing push, pull, hand squat, loaded carry. Every workout, just ratchet things down. On the loaded carries on your hard days, maybe you can do farmer walks or pushing the sled. We call them prowlers, but I guess not everyone understands what I'm talking about. And on the other three days a week, you could do the more restorative uh, uh, carries the rack walk, the waiter walk, and the suitcase carry. That's not bad. No, that's not bad at all. Good question, and thank you very much. Um, we have a question from Andrew. And he says, I'm a senior in high school, and I want to do easy strength during my pole vault season in a couple months. The thing is, I have a barbell with more than enough plates, a 45-pound kettlebell and 25-pound kettlebell. I'm also willing to buy a couple of bags of grass seed or manure from my local Home Depot. What do you think I should do for loaded carries? <laughs> well, don't, don't, buy, don't buy manure, man. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's, I, I mean, you know, it's gonna be prom season here, Andrew. Do you wanna really smell like cow poo on prom night? I don't think so. Uh, uh, just get playground sand, okay? It's a little more expensive. The upside of playground sand also is uh, if you break the bag, you just you can just pour it on a lawn or in a, 
on a fence, you know, around a fence. There's a million places to put it. That's why I got away, away from salt. Salt just kills grass and everything else, uh, any, everything. Um, and I got away from some, somebody told me one time I should buy bags of screws. And I thought to myself, what the heck? I mean, can you imagine carrying a bag of screws where you squeeze that thing and all of a sudden you got puncture wounds? Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, what do you think I should do for loaded carries? And then the, the, the last part of the question is, the kettlebells seem too light for farmer carries or suitcase carries. Thanks, Dan. I'll let you know how everything goes after my um, season ends. So let's just do this. I think you, you're already in easy strength. Um, yeah, I, the 45 pound kettlebell should be fine for waiter walks and suitcase carries. It should be. Um, but if you buy uh, playground sand, I think where I go, um, and I don't go to Home Depot anymore. Uh, they're, they piss me off. Uh, I go to the other ones. I go to Ace because they're locally owned. And uh, I will go to the other ones sometimes, but I, I try to avoid the place you recommend here. And who cares why? Um, if you can get the playground sand and then get a, a bag to put the bag in, uh, I used to take this far too serious. I, I'd have to get army uh, field packs and all this other stuff. And then I realized I'm just so overdoing it. Uh, you can fit two bags of sand in a typical high school backpack. Um, at, at least that's in my experience. Uh, when I was a teacher, I used to walk around the campus after the last day of school and grab up all the backpacks that the kids had just left in the hall. And I used to pick up the uh, the notebooks and the reams of paper. In fact, a whole bunch of my journals are, <laughs> I just ripped the, I ripped the kids' notes out because, you know, they'd have a 300-page uh, uh, binder, but only write on five pages, and so I had 295 pages to write. My favorite journal of all time, uh, I one I had at Utah State, uh, was my brother Phil's uh, history notes uh, that he dropped out of the class, and I just stole the binder, and I used that for almost two years. Uh, so on those backpacks I would pick up, if you throw a bag of sand into a, a high school, a typical book uh, book backpack, a, one bag of sand is fine. You can put it on your back and ruck, or you can carry it. Now, if you have a more sturdy one, generally you can put two bags of sand there. The only thing is, um, you just got to be careful when you, you know, don't try to not drop, you know, straight like that on the cement or something like that. But you can drop, you can drop the, the, those bags anywhere. Uh, when I first did this, I would cut the, 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 you know, the shoulder harnesses off the straps. And then later I realized that it didn't really help. Uh, and also too, then you couldn't use it for the uh, rucking. So I quit doing that after a while, but I would say to cinch them down as tight as you can. And it might even be worth, you know, my, running a, one or two loops of athletic tape. Don't don't make it too tight, just so they don't get in the way when you drop. I don't know if there'd ever be a problem. Just, I would do that because I'm a psychopath, I guess. Um, if you have a 50 pound bag and a 100 pound bag, you're, you're pretty much set for life. <laughs> I did go up to as heavy as 150 pound bags on these. The, the hardest thing, it's gonna sound weird, but when you have the three bags, when you hug, uh, the top one tends to just fold over and you really lose. The difference between the 100 and the, since it just kind of lays on your shoulder, you have all that extra strain, but you're not, I don't think you're getting the benefits of just the simple 100 pound carry. So on bear hug carries, especially for your age, Andrew, I would strongly recommend uh, a 50, a 50 pound bag. And by the way, with that one, you can carry that on the shoulders also. And you can also just press it up and do a, a waiter's walk like this or however you construct it. Uh, you could probably suitcase carry it too if you have, if you trust the straps, it's always it. And then have that 100 pound bag, which would be the two two bags of sandbag for, for the bear hug carries. And remember, when you're doing the bear hug carries, pick a time or a mark every so often when you stop and squat. So bear hug carry, you know, I don't know, from here to there, squat, stand up, bear hug carry, squat, stand up. And it, it, it you get that nice two for one with the bear hug carry. I think most people go too light on, especially the suitcase and the farmer walks. Um, so I'm glad you pointed that out. 
um, I, I'm surprised when I find out that men are using like 35 pound weights, uh, 16 kilos as their suitcase carry. Um, I mean, I expect my collegiate females to use 40s, uh, 88 pounds. Um, and so that's why a lot of times people don't get the benefits of the, the loaded carry family because they're going far too light. Finally, one other thing I want you to think about, and this is something I, uh, I did a lot of, is if you have the rucking backpack on, the, the 50 on your back, and then you pick up the, the anything, either farm work, suitcase carry, whatever, any other load, that double load I, I found to be very helpful for track and field and American football. I, I don't know if I can tell you know everybody to do that, but it really, really helped me. Boy, that was, that's a good question. I would like to know how you do this season, Andrew. Um, all right, let's uh, let's move on to the next question. That was good. Uh, Matthew has a question. I I'm personally someone who has mastered swings, mastered swings. Congratulations, and can even do a lot of reps for double twenty fours. Yet I'm still struggling so significantly with presses. I can barely get to five reps with the twenty four, and I've tried using ladders to up my numbers, but I've made much progress. What would you recommend? Should I train them daily? What would be the optimal amount of days I should train presses in a week? My goal is to do multiple reps without it being a strength exercise. I would like to do my armor building complex with them, but can only do this with my double 16s because my weakness is your press. Um, yeah, we this this is a topic that comes up a lot, Matthew. Uh, how can I improve my press? Um, in fact, it's a very, very common topic. Um, you probably need to press more often. Yeah, um, I made and I made my great leap in uh, squatting when I started squatting. The squat movements five days a week. The press movements five days a week. The press and the squat are two exercises that you need to pr you need to do them a lot. Uh, uh, so in a five day a week system, I would. And I, I like the fact that I'm, I'm getting essentially have double 16s and you've got double 24s, I'm guessing. But uh, I would I would maybe have a day. Let's just do the double days first. Okay, so one day a week, the double 24s, double presses. You, you're doing both. You're practicing. You're going. You're, I would say something along the lines. You said barely get five, but maybe, you know, do some repeat ladders of two, three, five, two, three, five. And if you can't get the fives, just go two, three, two, three. I'd like to see those fives in there. Just double presses. And there's your workout. Uh, get between uh, each one of those is 10. Probably get get between 30 to 50 total reps. So three rounds or five rounds or whatever. Another day a week, and I'd put that, you know, if, if you're doing on day one, maybe on day four, get the 16s and do 2, 3, 5, 10, 2, 3, 5, 10, if you can, if you can't, two, three, five, two, three, five. The problem with two, three, five, ten is every round is twenty reps. So doing two to three rounds of that is going to be plenty for you. Uh, so let's go. Those are so day one, twenty four Ks doubles. Day four, sixteen K doubles. Two, three, five, ten. Day two might be a real good day to get the sixteens and do half kneeling presses. Um, it could be as simple as three sets of eight. Uh, if my I, when my left knee is on the ground, I press with my left hand, and the only reason I came up with that is just to be consistent on how I make notes. So when I say I'm doing half kneeling press, that's what I do. You can do any vari variation you want, but so on the half kneeling day two, maybe a couple rounds of ten both sides done. Okay, now day three. Day three is a day I'd like to experiment and do some practice. Okay, practice. Um, I would suggest if you've never done them, day three might be a real good day to do the uh, waiter press. And that's where you hold the ball of the bell and press. And I've always liked this exercise because it insists on a perfect groove. And this day is simply practice. And I'd also like you to learn the bottoms up press. I don't have any kettlebells in here at the moment, but basically you're holding the handle and the bell is up here. Uh, when you first learn how to do, be sure you protect your face, okay? 
uh, you know, I, I always do that at, at, at certs, even though I know I'm not going to miss it. Um, so day one, 24s, doubles, two, three, five, go. Day two, half kneeling, tens, easy day. Day three, practice, waiter press, bottoms up press. Day four, doubles, light, okay, doubles, light, two, three, five, ten. Uh, day five, then, is the day I would like you to do singles only, and I'd really like you to see how many reps you can get. Always start with your your less strong arm, okay? Oh, <laughs> Some people say strong arm and then stronger arm. I think that's kind of funny. Um, always start here. Get a set of presses there. <sighs> match with your stronger arm. Go up if you can. Get a set of presses. Match with your stronger arm. If you can go up again, get a set of presses, match with your stronger arm, and get a lot of volume in single presses. Uh, for the equipment you have that you told me you have, <clears throat> I would say that's a good program. And uh, if you don't see progress in three weeks, uh, we'll have to have another conversation. But uh, at the end of three weeks, uh, I'd like you to have just back down to two or three press workouts uh, a week for about two weeks, and then you can repeat this again. You may have even repeat it a couple times, but you got to have week four and week five has to be uh, a drop in load. Um, and on those weeks, maybe get rid of the, just do the doubles, the heavy doubles, that light doubles day, and then that, you know, that heavy singles day. And th that should take care of you, okay? Great question. I hope it helps. Thank you. Got a question from Brad. I unfortunately injured my knee with an awkward landing, jumping to avoid a tackle in rugby game two weeks ago. MRI results are likely to lead me to having an ACL repair surgery. Okay. What would you suggest both to prep my body as much as possible pre-procedure, as well as upper body program while the knee is rehabbing? Planning to follow whatever PT plans the ortho team puts me on, but hoping to maintain as much fitness as muscle mass as possible. Concurrently walk slowly with a limp and have been doing a few sets of dips and chins a few days a week since the injury. Um, yeah, man, I, I've talked about this before and I'm shocked that's all you're doing now. I mean, for one thing, you've got to find me. Go find machines that you can do like leg extension, leg curls. I don't think leg extension, leg curls are necessarily that great an exercise and one-legged leg presses, but you're hurt, man. And every time you're doing those leg extension, leg curls and your presses, uh, you are pumping those hormones and all your minerals and all the magic all through your whole body. Uh, just a few sets of dips and chins. Uh, you got to do a lot more than that. Um, you can certainly bench press, you can certainly incline press, you can seated military, you can do every machine in the world, you know, uh, I would get as much work as I can on my upper body. Now, obviously, I'm going to tell you, you know, nutritionally, I mean, uh, I can't give you really advice about surgery, but I mean, I would drink a copious amount of water, I'd take, a, eat a lot of fiber, I would prepare myself for, um, depending on what, you know, some of those painkillers they give you, you know, just instantly constipate you. And I don't want you in that, in that place after the surgery. I got to tell you, the worst part of my, do, do, uh, both of my hip, hip replacements wasn't the surgery, it was those damn drugs. God, they killed me. I, I've had people tell me I did this and that later on. It's like, oh my God, these drugs are terrible. Um, yeah, the harder you work your whole body, the better. I, I'm going to tell you from the heart, uh, Turn yourself into a bodybuilder, as much upper body work as you can. Go for the burn, you know, it's 1977, you and Arnold, you know, are going for the burn. You're going to get high reps in the curl and the triceps extension and the lat pull down and all the other nonsense. Uh, and here's the other thing, it'll make you feel good. Whenever I get injured, I do get depressed. Uh, I'm like a dog, I need my walk, you know. But the workouts make me feel good and it, it really alleviates some of the depression that I get when I'm hurt. I get down when I'm hurt uh, and I don't like it. But I think I think you'll find some value in that, okay? Hey, good luck. Uh, I hope things work out well. Uh, it is strange how... It is strange sometimes how people get injured in this 
the oddest of ways. And I, I do hope you get better, okay? Thank you, and I hope it all goes well for you. Uh, wow, is this our last question? Okay, well, um, this is from Thomas. I heard you many times emphasize the benefits of the goblet squat. Can you explain why the front squat would not yield the same benefits as the goblet squat? Thomas, are you trying to say I either or something? Dude, I just got done front squatting. I love front squats, and I warmed up with goblet squats. Um, the, oh, okay, the biggest benefit of the goblet squat is that it teaches most people how to squat deep. It teaches most people how to squat between their legs, not on their legs, that they, we're not on top of our legs, that we're slung between our legs, and those lessons. It's also wonderful that you can, every single day for the rest of your life, you can do the movement of squatting and get the full benefits of how it helps the, your architecture of your body. Um, the downside of gobble squats is you kind of top out. Uh, once you get over 40 kilos, um, 88 pounds, 90 pounds, you start, I mean, yeah, I mean, I've done, I've done 106 pound, you know, 48 kilo uh, goblet squats, but really when you're in that range, you might as well just walk back over to the bar and start lifting. Uh, so what happens with the goblet squat, but is that there is a load issue. You do kind of run into a load problem down, you know, fairly regular, but here's the thing. If, <laughs> if you're my age and you're, you're goblet squatting at 24, the 28 kilo of four for the kettlebell, uh, for 10 reps. I mean, honestly, that's, you're doing great. You're doing just fine. If you're, if you're 30 years younger than me and you're doing the 24 for 10 reps, you're doing fine. You're doing great. Uh, I actually like the front squat more for my athletes. Uh, I got my athlete uh, today. In fact, I just got a little text from her and she's, you know, doing really well in the front squat. The downside of the front squat is the downside of the overhead squat too. Now, uh, you didn't say kettlebells or barbells, but let me talk about barbell problems and then kettlebell problems, okay? Uh, with the barbell, of course, you know, uh, today it was very cold in my gym. Uh, I'm getting ready for this Olympic lifting meet, so today was my first front squat workout in a while. It was freezing cold. It was so cold, I had to wear light gloves when I squatted, and I noticed that my wrist flexibility wasn't there yet. Well, in a couple of weeks it will be, but for a lot of people, you know, Driving the elbow forward, which brings uh, opens up a ton of space in the body. It's a weird thing to say that. Um, most of us were taught when we do our front squats to drive the elbows up. But you'll find if you drive the elbows forward, you'll, you'll feel like you've opened some space in your body. And it even seems to help you squat deeper. I, I can't explain why. It's just something I picked up. When it comes to wrist flexibility, most people don't stretch their wrists. They stretch their fingers. And you'll see guys doing this all the time. And that's great. Now you have, you know, more flexible fingers, but you still haven't bent your wrist at all. That's the position you got to get into. And of course, I have a very simple wrist flexibility drill. You put your pinky on your uh, sternum. Uh, you grab your thumb and then you just drive your fingers down to stretch this part of the wrist first. And then I get on the ground, uh, and you might have seen it in some of my videos. Uh, when I six-point rock, sometimes I'll turn my fingers back to my hands, and I'll you try to grab the ground with your pinky and your thumb, and then you stretch it, you know, this way, like you're you're doing a front squat. Um, I, I like those a lot. Um, wrist flexibility is an issue. Uh, you can you can minimize a lot of that by just actually practicing. I'm not a fan. You see it online a lot. If you're going to front squat, why don't you do it right? You know, some people say, why don't you do it like that? And it's like, okay. You know, but the problem is if you're an elite athlete or you're, you're my age, you want, you never want to compromise mobility and flexibility to put more weight on the bar. I'd much rather you learn how to, you know, get the elbow, shoulder, wrist, finger, mobility, because if you do fall and you, or you hit something weird, you'll have that little bit of extra range of motion that might just be the difference that uh, keeps you from a surgery or not. Uh, I love, I love 
the barbell front squat. I, I think it's a, a genius move. It is the position that we play sports in usually. Um, uh, unlike the back squat, which is not a position you get in very often in sports. Um, so I'm a big fan. Now, when it comes to the double kettlebell front squat, which you didn't, you didn't mention which one you're talking about, but I guarantee the question's going to pop right up after this. With the double kettlebell front squat, uh, the only thing I would like you to do, and it really does attack your anaconda strength. It really does attack your internal pressure. But I always like the thumbs to be on the chest if you're going to do it this way. But I also don't mind you interlocking your fingers. Now, somebody said, well, that actually turns down the amount of tension in your upper, uh, in here. And I thought, well, okay. But the nice thing about it is you get more reps, at least in my experience, I get more reps if I interlace my fingers. So the bells are sitting here and I just do have that kind of prayer hands position. Oh, okay. Um, I have no issues if you're doing this way. I don't, some people say you should do it like this for certain reasons. I think that is very tough because the weights are just sliding down. Um, so here, I, I like double kettlebell front squats. I like a lot for what it does for that internal pressure, uh, that that ability to, to it, the, I, the goblet squat and the double kettlebell front squat and the front squat are all exercises I call moving planks. And when you're doing a moving plank, uh, this area really has to stay locked and loaded and your breathing has to be <laughs> and uh, I think that's there's some real value uh, in not only making yourself a, a really strong platform physical platform for lifting heavier loads but I also think it makes you a little bit better out there in the field of play and if you're going to pick up a couch and help a friend move it you got to lock yourself down especially when you're trying to get a couch around a split level home or an apartment complex. You'll learn all you ever need to know about weightlifting if you ever try to carry down a fold out bed. It's a couch that turns into a bed. Carry it down a rickety flight of stairs, a fire escape. By the time you get to the bottom, you will learn everything you'll ever need to know about strength. <laughs> uh, I don't recommend it. Hire somebody. Well, good. Uh, wow. Wait, that's it. Okay, well, that's that's it for today. I can't believe that's all the questions. But as always, if you have questions, send them to the podcast here at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every one. Um, I come here every week. I, I do my best to answer these questions. And I, I love the, the, the responses I get. Um, uh, and as always, until next time, let's all keep on lifting and learning, okay? Thank you.